So a little message probably just popped up on your screen asking for permission to be recorded. Please select yes if you're okay with that. Welcome everybody to Chimney Swift 101. My name is Kevin Roth from the Pennypack Ecological Restoration Trust. I'm the volunteer education outreach coordinator here. I am also the program chair for Wincote Audubon Society. I'm also a park ranger from Montgomery County. So you might've seen me around the trails, maybe on some bird walks, um, some things like that. So always happy to have you people. Um, so I work at the Pennypack Trust. This program today is a joint presentation with the Pennypack Trust, with the Hicken Trails, and Wincote Audubon Society. I saw a good amount of signups coming from Wissa Hicken, so awesome to have you folks, some Penny Pack folks, and a cluster of people who are involved with all three. So thank you guys for joining us today. This is the first time I think we've done this presentation with this crowd, um, so it's going to be very interesting. We have a great presenter today, um, one of my favorite people, actually, and favorite birder. Um, she actually got me into bird banding. Um, took me out with her. So that was really special. Um, so yeah, we're very lucky to have Margaret with us today. I think everybody's admitted from the waiting room. So we are good to go. Uh, so welcome to Chimney Swiss 101. Our presenter today is Margaret Road. She's from Wissahickon Trails. Uh, Margaret grew up in Northwest New Jersey, where she spent her days exploring the woods and lakes around her home. I'm also from New Jersey, so we have that in common. Her love of wildlife and the outdoors led to a degree in environmental studies from Washington College in 2012. After a few nomadic years working with birds in Maryland, New Jersey, Florida, New York, Pennsylvania, she joined Wissahickon Trails in 2015. As their conservation manager, Margaret plans and implements habitat restoration and management. She maintains public trails and preserves, monitor uh, monitors their conservation easements and oversees the bird banding program. So she wears many different hats and I'm sure there's more jobs that she does not listed here. She is a North American Banding Council certified bird bander and she volunteers each year for the Cape May Raptor Banding Project. She also serves with me on the Wincote Audubon Board of Directors and in her spare time she's usually birding, hiking, biking, fishing, drawing, or reading, but mostly birding. So uh, Margaret's gonna present on Chimney Swift 101. Um, and if you have questions, like I said, put them in the chat. And uh, that's all for me. Uh, thank you, Margaret. And we'll talk after the presentation. All right, thank you, Kevin. That was really nice. And hello, everybody. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera off. I just got that little, your connection is unstable warning. So I'm gonna cut my camera in case that'll help me with some bad ones here. Okay, so. Um, just in case anyone has never heard of Wissick and Trails, and there may be some new people here, I just want to take a minute to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. So we're a nonprofit environmental group based in Ambler, and our focus area is the 64 square mile Wissick and Creek watershed, which is the area highlighted here on this small map. So that's the Wissick and Creek watershed within Montgomery County. And that is all of the land over which water flows as it makes its way to the Wissahickon Creek. We were established in 1957. And since that time, we've successfully saved close to 1300 acres of land from being developed within Monco. All of that land lies on the ancestral territory of the Lenape people. And it makes up our 12 preserves, all of which have trails that are open to the public from dawn to dusk. And I always like to make the point that Statistically, we lose 100 acres of forest per hour here, and all of that habitat that's lost daily is really significant. So these natural areas that we have preserved are really vital, and they are important for the wildlife that we love, as well as for our own well-being. So they're home to countless species, and they're also our community's connection to nature. A lot of my work as a conservation manager involves the restoration and active management of our preserves in a way that ensures the plants and animals around us have what they need to survive. And we focus a lot on improving habitat for birds because doing so means we are also improving habitat for insects and mammals, repti reptiles and amphibians, et cetera. So we do all of that work because we believe that people benefit when nature thrives. And our mission is to inspire as many people 
to protect and steward and enjoy the land and waterways of the Wissican Valley. And we do all of that through community support. So we don't get any state or federal funding except for some occasional grants. So it really, it comes from folks like you who care about nature and wanna stand alongside us in protecting it. Okay. So we're all here virtually to talk about chimney swifts. And we're talking about them because not only are they an amazing species to learn about, but also because their population declines over the last several decades have been really alarming. So I'm gonna go over a bit about their habits and behaviors and their natural history, and then talk a bit about what's going on with their populations, what conservationists and researchers have been doing to help them and to study them, and what some of that work has taught us so far. So chimney swifts are really amazing. They're among the most aerial of birds and spend almost every second of their lives flying, except when they're roosting for the night or when they're actively incubating eggs on eggs. They even bathe in flight, sometimes just in the rain as they're moving around, and sometimes by gliding down to the water where they dip down and kind of bounce off the surface and then shake themselves dry. They're some of the fastest flyers. They've been clocked in at 150 miles per hour when they're in pursuit of prey, which is insane. And as far as habitat, they're pretty cosmopolitan because they can live anywhere where there are insects. So you'll see them hunting over both cities and natural areas. They don't exactly have a song. It's more of a bubbly, high-pitched chattering, and it's really distinct. So once you key in on it, you'll probably hear it a lot of places that you go. And I'm gonna try to play it on my phone for you. So that's pretty distinct. <clears throat> and like I said, you'll hear that in a lot of places, both like over housing developments and closer to woods. And their sound is one of the easiest ways to distinguish them from bats, which a lot of people confuse them with when they see them flying. They look very similar in the air. And another giveaway is that they fly a lot higher than bats. And they're also not gonna be out at dusk when bats would be out. Uh, they're in the family of potidae, which literally means without feet. <laughs> so unlike other birds, they can actually perch and instead they have to cling to surfaces vertically. 95% of what they consume are flying insects that they catch on the wing. So their aerial life largely revolves around feeding and this is why we call them aerial insectivores. Jimmy Swifts are long distance migrants, which means that they travel a really good distance each spring and fall between their breeding and wintering grounds. They're with us in Pennsylvania in the spring and summer, usually arriving around like the first week or so of April. And then they depart after the breeding season, which wraps up in late August, early September. So pretty recently right now. They typically either fly along the coast of Texas and sort of hug the land. So they'll come down this way and hug the coast there, or they'll just go for it and shoot right across the Gulf of Mexico. And the data have shown that sticking to the coast of Texas is more common for them to do in the spring. Well, the more risky golf route is more common in the fall. And we're not really sure why that might be. In both seasonal migrations, they gather into groups but these are much larger and easier to observe in the late summer and early fall. When after the breeding season, family groups join together into larger and larger flocks that can be anywhere from just a handful of birds to thousands of them. And they migrate during the day, very high up in the sky. Then around dusk, they'll come together to roost for the night in a single place, which is usually a chimney. And that kind of a collective roosting strategy is a great idea because obviously there's safety in numbers and they're more protected from predators, but also because packing together in one space that way allows them to retain their body heat and maintain their body temperatures much more efficiently on something like a cold fall or spring night. Historically, chimney swifts inhabited old growth forests using cavity trees or snags with large hollows for roosting and nesting, as well as caves where those were available. But with European settlement, 
and the logging practices that occurred into the 1900s, much of the forests across North America were destroyed, and with them, vital habitat for a lot of animals, including chimney swifts. As those forests were rapidly disappearing, they were being replaced by farmland and barns and churches and, and houses heated using wood stoves and chimneys. So somewhere along the line, some clever chimney swifts started using those structures and it worked out for them because during the colder months when they were likely to have fires in them, the chimney swifts would be far away on their wintering grounds and only come back once it was warm enough that the chimneys were no longer being used. Chimneys are also a great alternative habitat because of their size and texture. So they're easy for the birds to cling to and they're large enough for a lot of birds to be in at once, which is critical during migration as they come together in those large groups that I mentioned for their communal roosting. Male and female birds who typically mate for life, which is cool, will work together to build half cup nests like the one you see pictured here. And these are made of tiny twigs that are held together and to the inside of the chimney using their saliva. Because their saliva is glue-like and as it dries, it hardens. And it's very strong. <clears throat> and a really cool thing is that since they can't perch or land, so they can't really like sit on a branch to break off a twig for their nest or pick one up from the ground like other birds might do. Instead, they will gather nesting material by repeatedly swooping by and hitting dead branches with their feet until the branch breaks. Then they'll catch the falling twigs in the air with their bills. And I've never seen that, but it sounds very impressive. <laughs> uh, and usually there's only one pair of birds per chimney, but often a younger unmated bird will help a pair tend to their nestlings. So you might see more than two birds flying around and going in and out of a chimney. And those unpaired helpers are usually, and in a lot of species that have cooperative breeding like this, they are young from the previous season that maybe just didn't mate up yet. So they're gonna help their parents raise the next nestlings. Some of them might be unrelated though, we're not really sure, but it's pretty likely that they are. And as I mentioned a little already, Chimneys with brick interiors or artificial nesting towers with textured siding, which I'll talk about more in a few minutes, are ideal because they have rough vertical surfaces that the Swifts can hold onto with those tiny little feet. And their, their feet are adapted by having four hook-shaped toes, which you can kind of see here. And the other thing that's cool about them is that they're in the, the genus Chitora or Chitora, which means spine-tailed. And that comes from their stiff tail feathers that have these spiny quarter inch long projections that provide them with that much more support when they're holding onto something sideways. So they're really cool. But despite their really rapid adaptation to using man made structures as they lost their natural habitat, according to the North American Breeding Bird Survey, swifts have declined by 72% in North America. 52% in Pennsylvania, and even more drastically by 95% in Canada. And that's just since 1968. They've been listed as near threatened here in our state since 2010. And so there are a few factors that could be contributing to this decline. For starters, over the last 50 years, we've further developed our heating systems. And instead of using chimneys, gas fireplaces and central heat are now a lot more common. Newly built buildings often don't even have chimneys anymore. And where chimneys do exist on houses and schools and other buildings, they're being capped or lined or removed completely. So combined with continued deforestation and the fact that we really don't like to leave dead trees standing because they are hazardous to us, chimney swift habitat is becoming more and more limited. Mortality along their migration route is also likely a factor. So significant declines happen in a lot of species when there are hurricanes during migration. And when that happens, it forces birds to reroute. And when they do that, they can quickly become exhausted and starve because they're flying more than they should. And hurricanes also reduce the availability of food for them because 
insects are not likely to be flying around in high wind conditions like that. And obviously food is really essential to migrating birds because they're constantly expending energy throughout their journeys and they need a ton of fuel and a lot of calories. We've already seen an increase in severe storms due to climate change, like last week. And so as that trend continues, it's likely that bird declines will also continue. And we will see this happening more and more in chimney populations. On their wintering ground, they also face a lot of habitat loss from deforestation, and in some cases far worse than they see here in North America. And as I mentioned, these birds are aerial insectivores and they're in flight almost continuously throughout the day, which means they're continuously using energy. If food availability is low, it can greatly impact their survival. And not only that, but the kinds of insects that are around for them to eat is important because some are more nutritious than others. So changes in their food supply might be playing a pretty big role in their decline. And for that reason, increased use of pesticides is one of the leading causes that we believe is leading to their, their steady decline. So that's sad, but some good news. In recent years, a lot of conservation organizations and Audubon chapters across North America have been working to help swift populations by creating habitat in the form of these artificial chimneys or what we call towers. They're pretty unique structures that mimic an actual chimney and they can be used for roosting and nesting. Obviously that's important because the chimneys can be used by the birds, but it's also important because most of them have educational signage like the one in this photo. And that's to help get the word out about how vital it is that we actively try to conserve the species. So these towers are a really good tool for education, even if the birds don't use them. It can take up to eight years I've seen for them to be found by the birds and used. So it kind of can be a long game once you build one. And for a lot of us who have been building towers, it's a little frustrating and it's a little sad because not all of them are used. And the reason why some are more favorable while others aren't isn't really clear. And there could be a lot of factors around why. And that's actually a question that I'm gonna get into more when I talk about a recent grant project that was completed. And on that note of grant projects, why would we want to study chimney swifts? There are many reasons, aside from the fact that they're really cool birds, but they are a really important species for a healthy ecosystem because they play a vital role in reducing pest insect populations. One chimney swift eats up to a thousand mosquitoes in a day. And that's, that's a lot of mosquitoes. And as we know, mosquitoes aren't just annoying, they're like one of the greatest vectors for disease. So limiting their populations is really important for keeping our communities healthy and reducing the spread of illnesses. Swifts are also a sentinel species, meaning that they can inform us of environmental hazards to our own well-being. And this is essentially the canary in the coal mine concept, where we're warned of risks either happening or to come by seeing that other living things are being negatively impacted. Since birds are high on the food chain, they react very quickly to environmental changes. So when something's happening with their populations, it's really important for us to pay attention. Swifts are also an ideal representative of aerial insectivores, which all together as a guild have been declining more rapidly since the 1950s than any other suite of bird species. Gaining a better understanding of what factors are contributing to chimney swift declines will also shine a light on why other species in their suite, like purple martins, barn swallows, and nighthawks that are pictured here, will also tell us why their numbers might be decreasing. And the last thing is that in the Pennsylvania State Wildlife Action Plan, chimney swifts are listed as a species of greatest conservation need. And animals that get that distinction are those that, because of on, ongoing downward trends in their populations, they're likely to become listed as threatened or endangered if we don't take actions to protect them. And as I mentioned, chimney swifts are listed as near threatened in our state, and we don't want that to change for the worst. And, you know, aside from all of these reasons, they're simply a species worth saving for their intrinsic value. And I think I could probably speak for a lot of people when I say that a world without them is a really sad thought. 
So now I'd like to share about a fairly recent research project that some local and distant conservation partners collaborated on to study Jimmy Swift populations and try to get some more clarity on what other factors are driving Swift declines and what might help them. And of course, the first step of any project is to get funding. And that's where the DCNR Wild Resource Conservation Program Fund comes in. The fund was established in 1982 as a way for people to contribute to the conservation of Pennsylvania's flora and fauna. Mostly it was through the sale of license plates like the one pictured here. Every year the program puts out funding priorities for projects that are targeted at helping us understand wildlife populations in our state. So a couple years ago, they sought projects that would investigate the causes of population declines in aerial insectivores, because as I mentioned, they're declining more rapidly than any other kinds of birds. Powder Mill Avian Research Center, which is a long-term bird monitoring station based in Southwestern PA, kind of near Pittsburgh, submitted a project proposal that would address that grant priority by studying chimney swifts. And since I have some friends at Powder Mill and I've worked there before, and we collaborate on some stuff, and because Wissick and Trails has been interested in chimney swift conservation over the last few years, we were able to be a subcontractor on that grant and collect some data during the 2019 breeding season. There were two overarching goals to the project. The first was basically to see what connections might exist between habitat type and pesticide use and the diversity and abundance of insects, the abundance of Swiss themselves, and then their behaviors. But pre predominantly, this was about learning more information about chimney swift diets, since this is something we just didn't have a lot of information on and it's really important to their survival, obviously. And then the second objective was to evaluate the effectiveness of artificial towers in attracting swifts by looking at what features correlate to the towers being used. And before I get into the specifics of the project, I wanna give you a little background on what some others have done to look into these same questions because what they found is really interesting. So in the most relevant study, and really the only one related to these questions, Researchers in Ontario studied changes in chimney swift diet as it related to increased pesticide use. They did that by collecting guano samples, which are droppings, from one chimney that had been used by swifts for both roosting and nesting every year for almost five decades. So the samples they collected basically represented a 48 year long dietary record. And it was over that same 48 year period that swift populations declined by 90%. In Canada. So the, the guano samples that they collected held all of the ecologically relevant indicators of diet composition. They contained insect exoskeletons and stable isotopes of carbon and nitrogen that provided insights into food web shifts, along with information on past levels of persistent environmental contaminants like DDT. So those samples were a natural archive of what had gone on with swift diets for the course of almost five decades and in light of changes to pesticide use. And what they found was that chimney swift diets revealed a steep rise in levels of DDT around the time that its use began. No surprise there really. But at the same time, the kinds of insects that the swifts were eating changed. So species in the order of Coleoptera, which are the hard-bodied insects, like ladybugs and June bugs, decreased in their diet. Well, insects in the order Hemiptera, which are the soft-bodied insects, like aphids and leafhoppers, increased. What is significant about that shift in prey availability is that hard-bodied insects are far more nutritious and calorie-rich than soft-bodied ones. So it could be concluded that DDT likely decreased the populations of those more nutritious insects. Swifts had less of them to eat, and so they changed their diets to less valuable but more readily available food. And at that point, their populations started declining. So that's, that's a really amazing study. And with those findings in mind, I'll get back to the grant project that was completed. And so that first goal, remember, was to learn more about chimney swift diet and insect availability. And to do that, we did two things. First, in order to get an estimate of the relative abundance of flying insects and what species were present where chimney swifts were nesting. 
we staple gunned sticky traps to the top of occupied nesting towers. So I put them on three artificial towers at Russian Woods Preserve in Newtown Square, where our partners at the Willistown Conservation Trust told us that they had three active nests. And these towers are all right near their new nature center and right next to an organic farm and some woodlands. And the Swifts seem to really like the communal nature of having these towers close together because they use them every year, apparently, which was interesting because usually towers are built kind of in isolation and on their own. Um, and so out in Southwestern Pennsylvania, Powder Mill put sticky traps on 10 occupied towers that were built by the Audubon Society of Western Pennsylvania, and also on a few actual chimneys where swifts were nesting. So every two weeks, we'd all go out and switch out these sticky traps to get new ones. And this, this went on from about June to late August. So we would collect the sticky traps, replace them, and all together we ended up with 67 sheets, beautiful sheets covered in insects. <laughs> and then each time we went out, we also collected samples of the birds' droppings or guano. To be able to do that, we first had to remove and retrofit the bottom of each of the artificial towers so that they could be like easily removed and opened to be scraped for samples. And that was pretty easy. That just involved some, you know, adding some hinges in the bottom screen. Most of them were pretty easy to fix. So by the end of the season, we had collectively gotten, I think, 52 vials of guano. It was a really fun activity, <laughs> especially when it was 90 degrees out. Um, and here's a video that I took when I was out there collecting samples one of the times. So you can hear, and you'll see really quick for a second, there was an active nest inside the tower. And anytime I was there and I made any kind of sound, the nestlings inside would freak out. It, it sounds terrifying. <laughs> so I'll play that for you. Kind of like out of a horror movie, but pretty cool. So that was fun. And to learn more about foraging distance, so how far the birds travel to find food and provisioning rates, or how far they, how often they leave and return to feed their nestlings, powder mill staff had to actually catch some birds. It was really cool. It's a part I wish I could have helped with. <laughs> but so they put out these flyers all over the place explaining the project and asking people to contact them if they had nests, swift nests in their chimneys. And they had a pretty good response rate. They were able to get out to 12 sites and catch swifts. And they did that by um, using a mist net and creating this hoop trap here that could be placed like a cap on the chimney. So when the birds went to fly in at dusk, they'd be gently funneled down into the net and caught. And they set the hoop nets on the top of the occupied chimneys about 45 minutes before sunset so they could catch the swifts going into roost for the night. And from the 12 chimneys, they were able to catch, I think, 32 birds. And all of those birds were banded on one leg in the usual way with a US Geological Survey aluminum band with a unique nine digit number on it. And 12 of them were also fitted with a nanotech is pictured here. So these nanotags are astoundingly tiny radio transmitters that put out a signal that can be tracked across the landscape as they get picked up by automated towers with directional antennas. And all of these nanotags operate on the same frequency, but each one broadcasts a unique ID code that's associated with one bird and one band number. So the automated towers that pick up these frequencies are part of the MODIS network, which is really cool and it's worth knowing about if you haven't heard of it. So I'll explain it real quick here. MODIS is the Latin word for movement and it's the name of this international collaboration started by Bird Studies Canada to understand the movements of wildlife. And these things are used on birds, snakes, butterflies, turtles, 
you can put these tiny nano tags on a lot of different species. And the project involves hundreds of researchers in the United States and Canada, South America, and I think even Europe at this point. So these towers are installed in arrays, usually along ridge lines, where tagged migrating species are most likely to be picked up as they pass within a given distance of the towers. Any tower can track any tag that comes within range and identify the species and the specific animal that carries it. And then that data can be downloaded later from the tower by researchers. And from Canada to South America, there, there were over 550 of these and an array of like 40 across Pennsylvania, but that was as of 2020. So those numbers might be even higher now. Okay, so now I'm gonna share some of what was learned from all of the data collection for this project that we did. And so remember the first objective was to learn more about chimney swift diets and their foraging behavior, provisioning rates, and how those things might or might not be affected by land cover and pesticide use. And then the other thing was to figure out what determines whether or not a tower is used. So the first data interpretation to be completed was PCR analysis and DNA barcoding of the guano samples that were collected at those 13 towers that had swifts nesting in them. And that involved complicated things that are over my head, but it, it took extracting insect DNA from the guano samples, amplifying it, and then sending it on to a lab that could do like the high-tech DNA sequencing. Um, so the most commonly consumed insect orders were Coleoptera, Diptera, and Hemiptera, beetles, flies, and chew bugs. And among those, the most common families were weevils, plant bugs, long-legged flies, and leaf beetles. And then the sticky traps, they were a little less complicated to analyze, obviously, because the insects on them were just identified to order using a key. And we ended up learning that 14 orders of insects were present at the towers where we sampled the guano. And the majority of them were flies and thrips. And in the process of catching swifts to ban them, they were also able to collect insect samples from the mouths of the two chimney swifts that were returning to the nest to feed their nestlings. And those are called regurgitin samples, <laughs> beautiful name. And one of the birds had 60 insects across six orders in its mouth, most of which were from the order Diptera, but also Hemiptera, Hymenoptera, and a few others. Mosquitoes and other flies though were the most abundant ones in that bird's mouth. And the other one, the other bird had 118 insects in its mouth across eight orders. Again, mostly dipterans. So swifts definitely do us a favor by catching and feeding mosquitoes, they're young, and they seem to have a preference for certain orders of insects. And the cool thing about this is that these results show evidence that Shimmy swifts don't just consume prey in proportion to what's available, but they maintain like a very diverse diet by seeking out some of the more uncommon prey and some of the insects that are, that are less available. So some things like in the order of Diptera that are like really common, they're everywhere, made up a smaller percentage proportionally in their diet to what they did, you know, in their availability. So that is really interesting. And all of this information, this is the first study to really comprehensively characterize chimney swift diet because there were no other peer reviewed publications related to diet out there. So that's really cool, really significant. And it's also a good baseline you know, for, for information that could be used in the future to see if there are any more shifts in diet over time. Um, so the swifts that were banded and tagged were all caught within 10 kilometers of at least two of those modus towers with the idea that the antenna bearings and the relative signal strength from the tags that the stations picked up could be used to estimate the foraging distance and the provisioning rates. And again, that's just looking at how far the swifts fly when they go to find food from the nests and how often they do so. And unfortunately, only one tower picked up the tags and the other four were not, that were within range did not pick up the tags. <clears throat> so without detections from multiple stations, they couldn't really calculate the foraging range and the provisioning rates. 
but as a next step, they can assess the relationship between signal strength and distance using aerial drones, which is something I think Powder Mill is going to do with another grant. So we might still be able to get some answers around those variables. And then one of the things that we hope to learn from all this information was whether or not landscape scale characteristics determined what insects were eaten and available to be eaten. So that's where geospatial analysis comes in. And that is essentially the manipulation of data based on location. And it uses tools like geographic information systems or GIS to display environmental information in a way that shows the relationships between different factors and how relevant they are to each other. So the GIS specialist at Powder Mill took pesticide use and land cover data from the Department of Agriculture and the US Geological Survey and overlaid the results of the insect abundance from the sticky traps, the diet information from the DNA analysis of the guano samples and swift abundance from the last five years of eBird sightings. And since there were only 13 towers occupied for us to sample from, and the eBird data proved to be a little sporadic in the area where the samples were, were taken from, there just wasn't quite enough data to compare. And that meant that no significant interactions between habitat type and taxonomic order of insects could really be determined with confidence. So, you know, it's likely that had we been able to sample in more locations, there would have been some correlation between insects eaten and the kind of quality surrounding habitat and how many pesticides had been used in that area. So more study is needed on this. It's a really important thing to understand because what's happening on the ground in terms of habitat where occupied chimneys are in comparison to like the, the volume and proximity of pesticide application, that will provide a lot of clarity on why the insect and guano samples show what they show and therefore how land use and pesticide use might determine diet, basically. So it's unfortunate we couldn't make any conclusions about those relationships, um, but it's good to remember this happens with research projects, especially with birds. It's hard to know how many nests you're gonna find in a season or how many individual birds you'll be able to capture and tag to study. So this work is ongoing and hopefully there will be more opportunities for similar projects in the future to kind of build off what has already been done. And the last element of the geospatial analysis that they did involved looking at the characteristics around each of the towers and chimneys where we sampled and caught birds to see what it was that might make them more preferable to others. And they found that the towers were marginally more likely to be occupied if they were in wooded landscapes but that was really the only land cover variable that, that it seemed to explain whether or not a tower was occupied. And it was kind of a small correlation. But since swifts usually foraged about two kilometers from their nesting sites and not that much further, and since this project showed they consume a large proportion of insects like weevils and things like that, that tend to be in wooded areas, placing the towers near forested spots is a good recommendation that might lead to some higher nesting rates, you know, for future towers that we build. So that was a good thing to learn. Okay, and I save the best, most important thing for last, and that is what we can all do for these amazing birds. So if you have a chimney, keep it clean, but only have it cleaned after the breeding season, which is typically, um, from like April to September. Don't put a cap on your chimney since this will completely prevent swifts from using it and don't line the inside since that means that that interior surface is gonna to be too difficult for them to hold on to. Nestlings in a chimney are pretty vocal as you heard in the video clip that I showed you and their parents can be too. So if you're lucky enough to have a nest in your chimney but can't deal with the sound, you can close off the opening to your home with some insulation that will dampen the noise. If you don't have a chimney, you can consider building an artificial one in your own backyard. And I definitely have some resources and can provide guidance on that to anyone who might be interested. And whether you have a chimney or not, one of the best things you can do for chimney swifts and for all birds and wildlife in general is not use any kind of pesticides or herbicides on your property. 
as you've heard from this presentation, they have effects beyond their target species. And then the last thing I wanna leave you with is that you can also become a community scientist and help us figure out where swifts are and what sites they rely on for nesting and roosting right now so that we can work to build a registry of those sites and then conserve them and make sure that they continue to be available to swifts. So we're trying to build this registry by asking that people fill out a really simple online form, which is really straightforward to use. It just includes information about a sighting or observation. So just things like how many birds you, you've seen enter a chimney, were they roosting or nesting, what kind of chimney, where's the chimney on the building and surrounding habitat, stuff like that. So that's pretty simple. I can actually drop a link to that form. Oh, no, I have the Zoom link. Kevin, maybe after the presentation in an email or something, we can conclude the link to that in case anyone does have chimneys or observations that they can submit. Sounds good. Just uh, send that to me and I can send a follow up with the recording. Cool. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's all I have for you guys. Awesome. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, do have a bunch of a couple questions in the chat. Um, that was really interesting. I learned a lot. Um, I think my favorite part was the insect uh, diet study you guys did. That was really interesting that they don't just choose what's abundant. They do. They are selective. They like certain things and they seem to know what's best for their, uh, their young. So that was, that was really cool that you guys actually pulled that study off. It's not easy to study these things, as she said, and yeah. almost everything we do takes a lot of time. Um, so I can't stress that enough, whether it's putting in a chimney swift um, tower or it's putting in a rain garden, it takes time to become beautiful and effective. Um, yes. So thanks for touching on that. Um, we have a chimney swift uh, house here at the trust and we use it pretty much just for education because it's not active and it's could use some maintenance and things like that. So, you know, these aren't, it's a lot of work to do this stuff and it takes some time to do it. Um, but that that is the good part about it is this stuff does work, but it does take time. Um, yes. So thank you for that. And obviously she means what she says. If you want to do this at your house and you're serious, she'd be happy to work with you guys and give you resources and things like that. Um, so let's go through the questions and then we'll wrap up here. Um, so at the beginning, you got some cool responses to the sounds, obviously. And if you can join us on Tuesday night in Bernathan um, to watch to watch this happen, you'll hear that very loudly, which is one of my favorite parts. Um, someone said, very neat tail adaptation. I also learned that. Um, Sherry made two comments about the locations. She said, looks like they need to be higher from the ones you showed early on. And then she says, I bet if those towers were placed on roofs, um, more Swifts would use them. What do you think about that? I've wondered about that a lot. So like, at one of our preserves, Crossways Preserve, it was, this was the first tower that I built. It's taller than the other ones. So if you use the recommended like construction plans, which are most commonly used, it's like a 12 foot tower, which brings you with the space between the, the ground and the tower. It's like 14 feet, I guess, total. So we built one that is actually like 20 feet. And that's one that hasn't been used. But then some towers that are like 12 feet tall that are just standalone towers like in a park have been used. So interesting. It's, it's, you know, it's a gamble. <laughs> interesting. And that I mean I think that's the same with some birds like bobolinks. Even if you provide them with perfect habitat, um, mm -hmm. they're they're used to where they're used to going. So getting them to yeah. find a new place, I imagine it's kind of a similar um, science to that. I think so. And like it, like I said, it was interesting that those three towers were used every year. And like that could be tied to that, you know, like if you put up an artificial tower where there's already Swifts using chimneys or whatever, you might be more likely to get them in there because they seem to like to nest near each other. They're like a little communal. Interesting. Yeah. And puffins are the same way, as I just learned with Project Puffin in Maine. 
that they <laughs> you can't just bring a puffin to a new place and expect them to return and raise their young. They're going to go back to the rock they were raised on and raise their young there. So mm-hmm. changing them is that's a whole very interesting ecology. Yeah. All right. Uh, next question here is the Swift Tower on Cathcart Road off of Morris Road being used by Chimney Swifts? No, that's the one I was just talking about. Our 20 foot one at Crossways. That's what I thought. Yeah. Um, but hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, oh. Has that been there for eight years? No, it's only been there since 2017. So, oh, good. so we've got time. Yeah, it'll happen. <laughs> it'll happen. Um, Next question from HL. Generally, is the public tolerant of swifts nesting in chimneys? I can see some resistance to having birds in one's chimney, similar view to bats. Mm, definitely some resistance to there. And that's partly just because people don't know about them, right? So they don't know what a cool bird it is or like what ecological services they provide or that their populations are declining. So to them, it might just be, you know, there's this chattering in my chimney that's driving me nuts. And they don't really have resources or know how to handle that. And there's a lot of like pest companies that, but actually like, so some people will call pest companies, but you're not supposed to remove a nest because they're protected under the Migratory Bird Act. So if someone does have a nest in their chimney, it can't be removed until the nestlings fledge, technically. I don't know how many pest companies know that or follow that, so that could be a problem. And that's part of like, you know, a need for more education around it. And so this presentation, we want more people to know this. And, you know, we're not just the crazy bird people. Like we have reasons for why we care about what we care about. So if you do have a neighbor or family member that has something like this, feel free to, this will be a YouTube recording. Feel free to share it with them. And just educating more people about this is the best way to go. As with almost everything we do in this field, there's, two sides to it so as long as we educate and leave the pitchforks at home we can make a difference um next question here is from uh, lewis i believe that is or lois uh, i have had swifts in my house house's chimney for decades would it be helpful for me to do some more systematic observation and reporting of swift arrivals and departure in numbers so 20 in the air just a few evenings ago yes definitely so, so all that yeah i imagine um, what yeah what what you're going to put in the chat and i'll email out is that yeah. document you're talking about yeah there you go. so lois i think that is um just pay attention to that email and we would love your information absolutely um and ebird isn't always a, a good place but that doesn't go directly to this study so please use right. the one that we provide yeah and then we have Diana. She says, where we live in Roxborough near Leverington Avenue, there are chimney swifts hawking around above our backyards each spring and summer, but this year there are fewer and they disappeared after late spring. Hmm. No question attached. I think that is kind of the question. Yeah. Any, any uh, information about that or? Hmm. If they left in late spring, I'm not sure. I don't know. And maybe they lost the chimney that they usually nested in, you know, like maybe someone capped a chimney or maybe something, maybe there might have been some development somewhere where their, their site was lost to them. They had to move on. But good observation. Those are exactly the types of observations um, that would be, if you're consistently reporting, they'll, they'll come in handy. Mm-hmm. Good observation. And we have Priscilla. Where have you seen chimney swifts near Ambler this year? Oh, if you've ever been to the Wissican Waterfowl Preserve off of Ambler, off of um, Maple Avenue in Ambler, there's always a ton over that. And there's a chimney swift tower on the island in the reservoir that I built a few years ago. I don't know if they're using it because I haven't like canoed out to it to look into it. <laughs> so they may be, but there's always a lot of swifts right there. Yeah. Interesting. That's still on my leg. I can't believe I haven't been over there yet. Um, there's always the rare birds in Montgomery County being reported there, and I haven't been there yet. So someone take me. Um, okay. Now, two more questions here, I believe. Oh, and you, um, if you do check the chat box, Margaret, put the, um, the reporting form right there. So if you want to click on that before we close out, open up the chat and click that link. 
Um, that way it's open in your browser for when we close this. Um, another question from uh, Dwayne, I think that is. Uh, what size property could you need, do you need to put, it, put in a chimney? Honestly, any size. You know, so like I mentioned, they, they're cosmopolitan, so they're everywhere. Like I'm here in Lansdale, there's chimneys all around here, I see them. And so if you have a small property and there's birds around, that works. If you have a big property or like, you know, several acres of like farmland or forest edge, that, that works. So honestly, you can kind of put them anywhere. Good answer. And as with everything, like uh, if you want to help the environment, there's little things you can do no matter what size your property is. Yeah. Um, and the last question we have here, if you do have any final questions, we have time, just type them in the chat. Otherwise I'll read this and we will uh, we'll close up for the day. Renee asks, do you recommend placing towers in the early spring rather than during the fall? Where would we get a tower to install? Hmm. Um, I think it doesn't really matter. I mean, if you, if you build it in the fall, then there's a chance we'll use it in the spring. If you build it in the spring, there's a chance we'll use it in the fall. But if you did get it in the fall, then maybe, you know, you'd have that much more time for it to be around for them to use to nest in. But either way. And then, so... There's nowhere that you could get a tower that's like prefabricated that I know of. So you'd have to build it yourself or get somebody to build it for you. It's a good part-time gig you could have there, chimney swift builder. Right. Yeah. Yes. But I, yeah, so like Wissick and Trails has built some for some people. <clears throat> so that is something that we, we do. Or at least I can help like provide a list of materials and like oversight and like be there for construction and that kind of thing. Awesome. Um, so the, that's the, the presentation, that's all the questions and there's good uh, background information and a lot of things that you guys can do at home um, and ways to just enjoy them. Um, depending on where you found out about this event, there was other resources for local chimney swift watches. The one that's directly related to this program is next Tuesday night. Uh, that will be in Brynathen at the uh, Yungi Ice Rink. Um, if you want to register for that program, just so we know how many number of people will, will be there, you can go to the Penny Pack Trust website and you go to event registration. And then there's a Chimney Swift watch registration. So if, you're, um, if you want to take this presentation to the next level and see this in person, um, that's a really great opportunity next Tuesday night. The only thing that will cancel that is the thunderstorm or rain, um, then we'll try to postpone it. Um, and if you can't make it that night, you can head over to the tower almost any evening uh, around right before sunset, kind of maybe 30 minutes before sunset. If you set up a chair over there, um, you'll see them start to gather and then they'll make their descent into the chimney, which is fascinating. So if you can't make, you know, make it next Tuesday, um, you can stop over any time in the next couple of weeks um, at a chimney that's active. So uh, I hope to see you all on next Tuesday. You can register on our website, thepennypacktrust.org. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. This program will be recorded. I will do my best to get that up in the next couple of days. So check your email. Um, if there's no more questions, I just want to say thank you, Margaret, Wissahickon Trails, Pennypack Trust, and Wincote Audubon Society for doing all the work you do. And thank you all for being supportive of our organizations and joining us today. So thanks again. Thank you, Margaret. And I hope to see you all next Tuesday. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everybody.